Okay, yeah. So um, I suppose I'll just get straight into it. Uh, just starting with um, a little bit about me. My name is um, Sean Russell. Um, I'm working with the uh, Financial Service Innovation Centre in UCC, um, or FSIC for short. This is just a small UCC research team that works with local industry partners to explore opportunities, opportunities in technology um, across a variety of sectors. So we kind of work with health and, and financial services as well. And um, they're both small and large organizations. Um, my particular area of research is UX, uh, UX design. So that basically means I harp on about users 24-7 and talk about UX all the time. Um, so today I'm just going to talk about um, Lean UX. So how many people are actually familiar with it? Yeah. Um, for those of you who are not, um, it's just uh, a design process or methodology, okay? So I'll explain a little bit more about it. So I'm going to kind of introduce it very, very, very um, uh, high level. Then we're just going to talk about kind of how it's going to be applied. And uh, you've been lucky enough to try some of this with some local industry in Cork. So we'll kind of go through some of those examples and some of those learnings. Um, so what is Lean UX? Um, Lean UX is a design process that places less emphasis on the deliverables and a greater focus on the actual experience the product brings about. So what this re really means is it does exactly what it says in the tin. It's less documentation and more product. Okay, So it's really about trying to get um, something out to market as quickly as possible and testing it there. So all of this came about by a, a genius called Jeff Gothelf. Um, he kind of coined it in, in around 2011, 2012. And you can read more about it in his book. Um, it is actually a really interesting read. Um, and he just tried to, he is trying to just, uh, like, he shows you the kind of, um, the tools that can be used to apply the Lean UX kind of thinking, okay? Um, its origins are, it's pretty simple stuff. It's pretty much Agile plus Lean Startup equals Lean UX. So for those of you who are familiar with Agile, it's the iterative software, de iterative software development methodology. So, you know, uh, principles such as individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working with software, or working software over comprehensive documentation, uh, focusing on the customer rather than contract negotiation, and responding to change, so being flexible enough to respond to research or new features coming in, etc. For those of you who are not familiar with Lean Startup, um, this is an approach to creating and managing startups with a focus on getting a product the customer, into the customer's hand as quickly as possible. So it's really about launching quickly, learning from it, relaunching, learning from that, relaunching. So it advocates the creation of rapid prototypes, um, it relies heavily on user and customer feedback, and it evolves iteratively. So therefore, Lean UX really is, it's customer focused, it's collaborative by nature, involving cross-functional teams, iterative by way, we just keep iterating, iterating, and we learn by doing. So we value a fail as much as we do a finished product. So is everyone kind of okay with that, or is that just a lot of mumbo jumbo? You can, it's okay? Okay, this stuff isn't all new. I mean, in principle, UCD has been around since the 70s. So it would have started off with cooperative design in Scandinavia, where they just worked with users when they're designing products or IT artifacts. It then kind of evolved to participatory, participatory design uh, in the States in and around the 90s. Um, so a great example of that is actually Windows 95. Um, thanks to Ali, who picked up after a new week. So um, in 1992, they, to, uh, they began to redesign Windows 3.1. Um, they were relying heavily on user feedback. Um, so the top 20 problems, Windows 3.1. They had a cross-functional team. They were moving away from the waterfall methodology. They had uh, a group of users that they could rely on for user testing. They built prototypes in VB and tested them while they were going through this. And like they came up with some pretty good results. I mean, to be fair, Windows 95 isn't that bad. And I'm using a Mac and saying that, so that's something, right? Um, and obviously, as well, there was less documentation. Um, that it was the prototype and the product as spec. Uh, the good things that came about it were that actually some of the user language around um, labels of, of certain parts of the, of the OS were made better, particularly help topics and instructions. And the uh, wonderful start menu came from that as well. So, being able to kind of click into the most common things in as less clicks as possible type. So like that all came about just from a user-centered design process. Um, 
Similarly as well, uh, the Agile methodology was slightly adopted in 2007. Uh, people may be familiar with Sprint Zero or Staggered Sprint, so that was kind of to try and get this uh, design back into, this, the, um, into the Agile methodology. It, it had some success, but then again you always have the designers and the researchers working at least a sprint ahead of the developers, so we're not all working on the same thing at that same time. There's still a mini waterfall, like a little trickle on the stream. So, um, so Linux try to, tries to um, integrate a little bit better with Agile. Um, what is new? Well, we are really technosapien. We have evolved. Um, does customers expect so much more these days? Um, so everything's faster, we want more. We want it on mobile, we want it on tablet, we want to be able to bank, shop pay bills, uh, book tickets, we want to be able to do this all online, e on any platform. So customers' needs and expectations have increased. Um, the speed and power of technology has also increased. So um, as developers and designers, we actually have better machinery to build products. And equally, like pattern libraries and, and frameworks and stuff, like they, they have come on so much in the last 10 years when these methods and agile and stuff were kind of popular. So we've got the tools to build stuff faster and stronger and better and repeat and, and continue to prototype. Um, and also the, the, the technology that the customers have has improved as well. So they expect more again. And also the multiple platforms things. So what we kind of need is uh, a process that kind of actually allows us to develop products as quickly and as well as, as what the customers expect. Um, Lean UX, why Lean UX fits is, well, it focuses on the user, so whatever the, the real, whatever the problem is, we're trying to solve it with technology. Um, it, it aims to deliver products really, really quickly. Um, because they're real products that are going to market, we can measure real outcomes. So we use analytics to, to um, assess our performance, and we also can use like customer feedback, real user feedback. Did you like this? Did this work for you? Rate this now? No thanks later. No thanks. So um, we're all familiar with these kind of things. And that's real, real feedback. It's not user testing. Um, obviously, we learn by doing as well. So um, because technology is uh, always, always um, improving, we need to be able to pivot quickly. We need to learn all the time. Lean UX facilitates that. We see failure again, fail fast, learn quick. Um, because everyone's learning, we're all happier. Um, and if we're happier, it's generally we work faster and it costs less. So yeah. So how can I start? Um, so Lean UX in the strictest store, uh, sense can be really, really hard to achieve. Um, if you read the methodology, or if you read kind of Jeff Gothel's um, book, like it is quite an, it's quite an intense kind of setup. You, you know, it's very about like creating hypotheses, understanding your customer inside and out, sketching all the time, having a design studio every day. It's quite like militant, okay? But it does work, okay? The thing is, is that it is very hard to do that because it requires a massive organizational um, and cultural shift. You have to get people to work together as if they are really, really great friends. You've got to, um, you've got to, you really do have to um, be passionate about what you're doing because else it won't really work. You've got to externalize your workings the entire time. You've got to be constantly commu in communication. It does really require co-location, although, we, although we, we can find that there are ways of getting around that too. So because of that, I think that what's happened is like Lean UX got a bit of slack because of that, and I think that's fair enough. Um, but it did evolve a little bit earlier this year, and I just thought it was quite interesting, um, because some guys, mainly a guy called Anthony Viviano, he came up with these 10 principles, which are kind of like rules of thumb um, for Lean UX. And it, it's just kind of like, if we can keep these high level, um, I just realized I'm moving all around the place, you must be dizzy, sorry guys. So the, um, no, the, the, the thing is, is these high level values that we could kind of instill in our own work every day, at least a little bit of Lean <coughs> will be kind of, will be happening, okay? We might not change the, the organization overnight, but we can kind of change the way that we work a little bit. And if we do that, then maybe slowly but shortly, lean will become the way. So that's why it is a little bit lean, right? So these 10 principles are pretty, um, pretty handy. I'm not gonna go into them in too much detail. We can come back to them later, and again, these will be available after. So um, again, just working as one team is probably up there as being one of the most, things, uh, one of the most important things. 
This is hugely important as well as externalizing. So work isn't useful unless it's off your desk and on the wall. So that's generally how it goes. Get, you know, if you learn something that day, share it with the team. Uh, if it's over coffee, oh, I was reading this, excuse me. Um, just get your knowledge out there, get your, your latest draft, your latest sketch, get it up there for everybody to see and kind of get feedback on. You might be doing this already and that's brilliant. These are just, again, this is lean needs. Goal-driven and outcome focused, so that's kind of um, what does the user actually want to achieve and how, how are we going to, what's the quickest and easiest way of allowing our user to achieve that, whatever it might be. Repeatable and routinized, this is about kind of process efficiency, so things like creating templates for sketching or, you know, um, maps that people can fill in really easily. If it's, um, uh, it could be pattern labels, for example, or frameworks. Uh, user test scripts, uh, anything which can be repeated and it just so the effort really is on about the actual unique session and, and just basically on that unique part. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty straightforward. The flow, this is, be, it's actually build, measure, learn, but it's going to be modified for think, make, check. I think the reason is, is like thinking is more about understanding the customer first, making is the sketching, prototyping, and that can be done either on paper all the way up to code and then the checking is that measure and learn part which is we, we learn something and we feed that back into our idea generation again. Focus on solving the right problem is pretty evident. Generating many options, that's really important as well. Our first idea is never the best idea categorically. So generate as many options as you can, validate the best one at the time and you'll always have two and three there in your back pocket just in case. So it is really, really important. Decide quickly what to pursue and hold decisions lightly. Um, that's just be really flexible. Like just because it's a really hot idea today, be prepared to drop it tomorrow if the users come back to you and say, I, I wouldn't want to use that. So don't get attached to anything until it's out there. And even when it's out there, don't be that attached to it. Yet still be passionate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, recognize hypotheses and validate them. Uh, this is just saying speak for like if you're making assumptions, stay it's an assumption and try and validate it as quickly as you can. By that I mean just, I mean validate, what a big word. Just, no, this, you know, I was talking to the coders, no it's not, right? But like what the, the actual, like it's really just about asking users is does this make sense or does this work? Just that simple, you know, over a point, does that make sense to you? Like that's validating an assumption somewhat. I mean a bit more rigorous sometimes. Um, and I think this should be number one, all right? Research with users is the best source of information and inspiration. So just always ask people, what do you think of this app? What's really annoys you about this? I hate when it's done. Listen, everyone's a user. We're users ourselves, okay? We're super users, but you know, everyone is a user. And so just listen to what they're saying the entire time and you will get, you'll get inspiration from that. So the t they're the 10 principles. Um, I thought this was quite interesting as well. Um, and this is kind of leading us onto the next point. So Lean UX principles are tools. Um, they're good tools, but they shouldn't be the only tools in your toolbox. Choose the best one for the job at hand. And I think that's, that is true. Like all these principles, it's great, but like you can't follow them all the time. And, and sometimes you've got a job to do, which is fair enough. But like every now and again, just kind of go, actually, am I externalizing? Could I use this tool here? You know, play around with them and be flexible. Um, so in practice, so okay, these are just some examples of where Lean UX principles have been applied and some of the success successes around them. So Barclays Ping It, or is everyone aware of this app? Is anyone aware of it? It's very similar to um, uh, Me To You by AIB. It allows people to transfer money between their smartphones. Um, I mean, this was hugely innovative in the UK in about 2012. It wasn't developed in like using Lean UX. I mean, they're a huge organization, but it actually had a lot of uh, similar principles or, or like um, they adhered to a lot of, of principles um, that are similar to Lean UX. So things like they had a very clear vision about their, what they wanted to achieve. It did one thing, it transferred money. It did not try to be an online banking mobile app day one. Um, so they was like, right, we're just going to allow people to transfer money really easily. In the same way that in Windows 95, they just said we want an OS to be easier for new begin or for new users. So they're very clear on what they wanted to achieve. They started and ended with the user. They asked people, when do you transfer money? Was it at the end of a, um, at the end of dinner when you were splitting the bill? Was it for paying bills if you lived or splitting bills when you lived um, with housemates? They understood when people started using. Um, uh, when, uh, when people were dividing bills, they understood the context of it. And what did they have their mobile on that? They did a lot of research up front. And 
the best part of them, I'll get into the end, but they actually did so much um, testing with the user when it went live. They had a really passionate cross-functional team, and this is something that did not exist in Barclays until this team came together. So, so before that, they would have they would have contracted in Accenture, they would have had another contract with another design agency. They'd be working in silos within Barclays, and they'd never talk to each other, and they'd be able to be developing a mobile app. So it was crazy, and they were spending so much money on it. Um, so they decided to do away with all that, get a, assemble a team that was cross-functional, cross-skilled, um, but very focused on this one project. And they still had some contractors in as well, but they had to believe and they had, or they had to have that vision too. And this is the most important thing, they launched to learn. I mean, this is like, um, like banks are very risk averse. And to launch something that wasn't 100% perfect, I can just imagine the guys at the top shitting themselves there. So they basically launched to learn, and within the first quarter, they had released three different versions. So, um, and like that, what they were doing was uh, testing with the users constantly. So there was, um, uh, they were looking at Facebook and they were doing Facebook polls. Uh, they were doing sentiment analysis on Twitter. So they were understanding what people were saying about their, their ping at app. And actually, as a result of that, um, and this is quite interesting, they found out that a lot of people were using it to pay like pocket money to their kids and stuff like that. And you know, kids of, that had to be 18 years old. Uh, so they actually dropped the, the age of um, the restrict or the, the age of consent or whatever it is. Sorry, that's totally not it. But <laughs> the age of uh, accepting terms and conditions on this app um, from 18 to 16. So they actually kind of opened up a new market for themselves just by listening to what people were saying and kind of all that kind of stuff. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, yeah. So this is just, again, this, you can just look at kind of what they did. Um, it was hugely popular. And I think one of the biggest things that came from that as well was it actually gave them the confidence to go ahead. So six months later, they ended up deploying Barclays Mobile, which was the entire suite of things. And a couple of months later, they integrated the two of them together. Um, it still exists as a single app as well. Um, yeah, that's, you can look through that in your own time. So coming a little bit closer to the home, uh, Compliance and Risks were um, or are a company that creates software that informs product teams, um, such as engineers and managers, of changes in standards and regulations. Um, so very recently, they wanted to go about uh, redesigning their main product. And they were looking to understand how um, UX could help them, and actually even Lean UX. So they wanted to move into this kind of less documentation, more actual product. Um, and uh, yeah, so they kind of, we, we managed to get in touch with each other and, and kind of do some work with that. Um, we ended up kind of sitting down and kind of figuring out what the best thing would be to do. And we kind of said like, we'd loosely come up with a, a, a process, I don't want to call it a process, we kept the focus on actually less documentation, having repeatable, re, um, reusable components, um, and creating actual products. And we came up with a UX toolkit that has, it basically, basically gathers uh, templates and resources together in one place, it's going to act as the foundation moving forward. Um, this has only been in place about three weeks, um, and already just talking to to them uh, yesterday, like they were kind of, we were just talking about how's it how's it working, what's going well for you, what's not going well for you. Oh yeah, another huge thing as well is um, their development team is based in San Francisco, so we have to we have to overcome that as well. And remember, co-location is it's almost the most it's one of the most important things in New York because you need that constant communication. So we'll talk about that as well. But already seeing improved relationships with clients because um, they're appreciating kind of being involved in the process of shaping this new product. They're saving loads of times by being focused in the design studio, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, they're building better products already. They're saying that, yes, we feel like we're creating products that meet needs. Uh, we're not burning money anymore. Whoa, come back to me. Sorry, you're out in the night. Uh, we're not burning money, I thought that was interesting. And we're learning before development, so we're learning. Um, when it came to challenges, there's um, some kind of things around like educating the benefits of Lean UX. And actually maybe that isn't evident until the, the actual product is going out there. And then we can see actual real feedback coming in. So maybe, maybe that will kind of improve in the next couple of weeks. And educating how, so, um, but like, how are we, 
like how can the toolkit lift literally from the paper into the team so they're still working through those things and I'm sure it'll take a little bit of time but it's definitely um, it's definitely having some impact over there um, James Kyo also um, has kindly allowed us to share this UX toolkit so you guys are more than happy to, to go and take a look download it uh, sift through it if there's any tools that should be added shoot me an email I can add it in and we can make it bigger or better everyone should use it any templates that are there as well I can supply those separately so feel free to use them and feedback what worked what didn't work because that's where the value is we constantly learn um, so section 3 the UX tool toolkit um, yeah, so this, this is a create, it has about 18 resources, which we kind of sat down and said uh, they're useful when I'm trying to apply Lean UX, I'm trying to get Lean UX across. I'm going to go through four of the key ones that would apply to Lean UX today. Um, and the rest of them then are more UX tools. It's kind of think about that, we'll pick and choose when we want to use what we want to use. So if we're understanding more about customers, we might use a proto persona and some empathy maps, okay? They're just, they're just little tasks we can do to help us focus on understanding more about the user. We'll, we'll veer away from that today because it's not really lean, it's, it's, it is, uh, it's just UX. Um, so this toolkit, as I said, it brings together templates and resources. It provides a few tips on, on how to do these kind of things. And it's organized by stages of design and development of the process and, and in compliances and risks. So the first one, and <coughs> like, this is definitely the most important. We'll call it a tool. Um, it's not particularly one, but it's, um, it's the design studio. This is also known as the strategic session. Okay, this is basically you get everyone in a room and y you get them to generate as many ideas um, as possible about a specific problem, okay? So we use it to generate lots of ideas really quickly. It's really great because everyone gets a say and everyone gets to kind of bring their ideas to the table. And there is, should be, a tangible output to any, every one of these workshops. So they, they typically last between two to three hours. Um, the structure presented here is you define the problem. So the problem is, um, it could be a user story um, supported by analytics. Um, you could have uh, customer feedback in there. It's, you, you literally present the story, you present the case to everybody who's on the team. Products, product managers, project managers are there, developers, designers, UXers, researchers, um, account managers, anyone who has any interaction with a client. So whatever that is, define that problem. So one person is presenting the problem. Then everyone goes away and they sketch for five to 10 minutes, uh, usually on six up or three up templates. So that's literally three panels or six panels on a page and you sketch ideas to, to meet those problems. Then everybody feeds back. So everyone gets to present their ideas and the team kind of goes, oh, that really works. I love what you've done there. Maybe why could you, uh, hopefully you could extend this by doing that. So you provide a bit of constructive feedback and then you go away uh, for another 10 minutes and you refine maybe two of those ideas based on the feedback that you have. Um, and then you do one final presentation back to the, um, the team and you kind of prioritize which of the best ideas across everybody, what's come together. It sounds like it would be ridiculously messy, but if you stay focused, it actually does end up showing some really good results. And I, I will show you an example of that right now. So um, James went away last week um, and he got a user story together. So this is him defining the problem. He presented this to the team. I think everyone was pretty much fam or was pretty familiar with this uh, problem at the time. Um, so they, they basically knew that they wanted to improve. I think it was it was kind of a page that they landed on after this this problem occurred for the user. So everyone went away um, and they sketched their initial ideas on three ups in this case. So one, two, three, um, and presented back to the group. Everyone, get, um, everyone got feedback then from the group. They went away and they turned those into two sketches. So they're getting a little bit more refined. In this case then, um, everyone presented back and they kind of took the best ideas and distilled it down. Now because they were remotely located as well, they used, actually I'll talk about that in a second. Um, um, so then they got their distilled ideas and by the end of the session, so later on that day, they were able to get a first draft wireframe together. Now, like, that's pretty impressive. Like, it is pretty good to go from that to that and everyone being involved in it and everyone understanding where it is. So when the developers got this wireframe, they're not like, whoa. They're like, actually, that's my idea. And, I, and even in between the wireframe being created, 
at the end of the day and the workshop that happens in the morning developers can go off and you know think about services they need to call or things they need to decouple designers can go away and go well I need to update um, a style guide here or I need to um, think about what I'm going to do for this creative content writers can go off and do their thing everyone's kind of primed in the morning everyone gets to do about a three or four hours of focus work and then they kind of there's a little bit of an output by the end of the day sometimes enough to test or you can test the next day. And that's where the UX comes back in and says, right, we've, we're going to validate this idea. So the next step for this is put it in front of some real users. Get it out there straight away. The faster you can do that and validate it, the better, because then you can proceed. And that's, that's the essence of Lean. Um, so in between design studios, we have the wall. Um, this is literally the biggest tool we have. So. Um, yeah, we, basically all we're doing here is externalizing our work. So this can be like through post-its of ideas. We've got sketches going on over here, grouping going on. So there's lots of different things you can do. You can, you can, you can play around the wall, but you can also have structure. So that's going to be very, it will be dependent on the type of organization you work in. Some people will want to ridiculously organize other people and create it exactly. You just throw it everywhere. They'll have uh, competitors, products up there. They'll have everything going on. Um, work with that, a wall is a wall, it's a space for you to use. Just some examples of that out in uh, Leia, they got, they're working a big project, they put it out onto a wall, and we use post-its to, um, green was for requirements that had come in from the customer or the users, yellow were ideas that were being generated, and orange were kind of warnings or things that we need to look into. So, um, and I did mention that uh, these guys were, were remotely uh, located in um, with compliance and risk, so they actually managed to kind of overcome that a little bit with something called Padlet. And I'm sure there's better software out there for this. And if any of you guys have any um, any recommendations, I'd love to hear them. It was just literally they would they would get the snippets up there, they would get images up there. I mean, effectively, it's it's a Pinterest for your team. Um, but again, just keeping that kind of live, that feel of like we can share our ideas really really quickly. Um, user testing, like. I have a note here, it's so important. So it really is like, I mean, this is the thing that I'm, all, I'm always harping on about. This is the ridiculously formal user testing. So you've got click tests, you've got five second tests, you've got like how to conduct a user test, when it's good for that and all that stuff. User testing, formal user testing is good. So is informal though, um, definitely. Um, internal is okay. So testing with colleagues and stuff like that, it's great for a little bit of validation. But external is awesome. So get them, get real users in, real customers in, or go out to them and get their feedback. As soon as you learn something, socialize the results. Get out there and be like, oh my god, guess what I found out about our app? Or oh wow, this didn't work. I never thought it would work that way. So then everyone gets to understand what's working and what's not. Um, Gorilla testing is the informal thing I'm talking about, right? So. Um, Get out into a coffee shop, okay, and uh, test with real users. Uh, test, let them figure it out on their own. Don't give them a task. Just be like, here's something, can you use it? I'll buy you a coffee. Um, and it sounds really weird, but it actually works really, really well. And I'll prove it. I have, I have a video. This is a video. Um, So she figured it out. It was pretty cool. I also loved it at the start when she's just like tapping it and you're like, Can you just wipe it, please? Like, again, but that actually was a flaw in the design. That was our fault. And we actually managed to, to figure that out. Um, 
is also like a ha take on me in the background as well, and me going, yeah, 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 yeah. So that's guerrilla testing. But honestly, I mean, we got, uh, on that day, we got 11 users in four hours, and it cost a grand total of 28 euro in coffee. So, you know, not doing too badly. Um, and we got some really great feedback on that. Um, ask questions as you go, that's another thing as well, is you don't ask them their kind of stuff up front, is as they're going through it, I mean, people can talk and use phones, we do it every day. So ask them, like, oh, do you have health insurance? And, you know, wh is this something you use? Get those questions in as you're going and kind of build up a, an image of, of that, that, that person as you go. You've already got two minutes to get as much information as you can. Finally, um, because it is totally unfair that I haven't done enough on this, but actually web analytics is so important. Again, it's measuring a real outcome. Um, again, this is included in the toolkit and there's more on this. And I'm not an analytics ex expert, but I do know that it is really important to kind of go, what are we trying to achieve? What do we, what do we need to measure? And what are the, the um, like how are we going to measure them? What are the funnels? Identifying those funnels and then testing them and, and getting all that stuff out. So I, I think that the pirate metrics by Dave McClure are really, really cool as well. Um, they're worth looking at. Um, so yes, I definitely, I'm two minutes over, so apologies for that. But really what I would talk about with Lean UX is um, it's build real products, actual products, try and get it out there as soon as possible. Work together, just work together, collaborate, it's so important, get that, get that going. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and that will work really well. And then iterate, just keep learning and doing. So um, yeah, happy to help any time, use my contact details, just drop me a line or whatever, that's grand, so thank you. Sean, uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, you mentioned before you had a, trying to get the designers and developers to work at the same sprint is hard. Yep. How do you do that when you have to first, if you've got a sprint that's two weeks long, yep. and you have to design it and you need to actually spec it out and then code it? Yep. How do you achieve the, the designers and developers to work on the same sprint? Okay, cool. So um, what's kind of being done at the moment um, is you still have your integration planning meeting at the beginning of every sprint, right? So that's everyone's in, in, in the room together. That's yeah. designers and, and UXers should be in that room as well. Prior to that, we do a massive design studio. That's where the idea generation comes. So you have designers and developers generating those ideas together. So as soon as you leave that, you're pretty much ready to start thinking about the stories in your APM. And then what happens is you're prioritizing your stories in your integration planning. And halfway through, so at the end of week one, you'll probably do a usability, you'll have usability testing happening from a UX point of view, while the developers get, a, get to go on and, and whatever's been planned. Developers going doing developer stuff, UX are going testing and designer getting on with that. Week one, there's testing. So at the end of week one, you have some results back and you can feed that back in. So, but it, it kind of, it's like you have two sessions of testing happening in the same sprint, in that two week sprint. But that, what the most important thing is that that design studio or design, there's like a day where everyone's working together to, to, the, to generate those ideas. Those problems are there. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. That makes sense. So it's about fitting that design studio into the sprint before the sprint kicks off. And, see, it, and then when the next sprint starts, you still have another design studio and APM, but it happens before the APM. Okay. Yeah. Is, is design kind of in conflict with uh, Agile because it's cheaper to get the design done first and then implement it rather than change the code after it's uh, coded? Yeah, it's probably going to be cheaper up front, um, definitely. But what will happen is if it isn't tested and it isn't iterated properly, you run the risk of failing when it goes to market. You use prototypes. Uh, yeah, you, you could do that too, um, but you're still pay, we're paying more money then into prototypes, aren't we? Because that's that, that it's going to take time to develop a prototype. Well, it, it should. That's the whole um, So the question is kind of like, what? How, what's the so? Yeah, how does design fit into agile? Well, I mean, the, the agile methodology is like no, not much design up front. Is what? Not much design up front. Okay. Yeah. Uh, whereas design is you know, iterating, prototyping, getting feedback. Yeah. Um, this is, I mean, by its nature, implementing isn't very agile. You know, it's, you know, if you change design, you then have to change all the code. It's just a big pain. Like, you know. 
Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I suppose it is about getting the balance right too. I mean, like, because if you were designed that epically fails and you code behind that, that is a disaster. But if you have a small piece of a product that works really well and is designed well and, and the code is, is flexible enough to change as well, and that's what we work towards is that re repeatable, rinsable thing as well. It is a challenge, definitely. Um, but I think it's probably about kind of trying to achieve that balance, design and agile. That was the most political answer ever, I apologise. But that, that would be my, what will be my answer. It's about trying to get the design and, and the development in, in balance back in sync. And on the, same, on the same, happening at the same time, rather than designers handing something over to the developers, that's the, the, the thing we want to break. At the same time. So, but I mean, developers, like, but developers need something to work with. Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, but like while a designer is going away and getting a first sketch together, a developer could be thinking about the services or uh, that they're going to pull in to, to produce the functionality for that page. Because everyone has an idea up front of what, what, what we're trying to achieve. So the de developers know what they should, what, what they, what, for example, what classes they'll need to bring in for this specific page. Whereas a designer on the same, in the same morning is thinking about where is that information going and what does it look like. So that by the end of the day, you're kind of going, hey, this is, and you've managed to pull it in and whatever it looks like, and they've managed to say, look, this is position on the page, it should be on or whatever. So it's, it's just about trying to marry them a little bit closer. That probably doesn't completely answer your question, but we can talk about it later. <coughs> Well, it's the time it is, I think, that one, in terms of, because uh, I, James talked about the compliance and risk. So on one hand, I suppose it is, so what we're doing right now is prototyping, but it's involving the developers uh, in, this, in the UX in the, in the design studios and the clients, and the developers are just getting bundles out of it, because they're going, Jesus, that's how clients work? That's how they think? And it's just really, that regard, so uh, one that we're kind of always prototyping one degree, but it's influencing our entire our re architecture that we're doing behind the scenes. It was very challenging, but also trying to do it with a live platform with 3,000 users and 300 customers. But it's really it's just saving them a lot of time in development because they're, they're really understanding the intent. And they're able to get lots of really, I suppose, beforehand. You know, so, help out, but some insight from our side. So, do your um, UX designers do all the wireframing and then developers get involved? Developers, so the design studio what we have is we have someone from sales, we have someone from customer relationship, we have someone from development, we have someone from uh, product management, uh, we have some people from our internal, our even internal business analysts who 